since my place people are uh, follow tibetan buddhism so it teaches a lot about kind compassionate you know uh, be a good human being so actually when we grow up uh, the first important thing our parents tell us is not to be a successful person or a rich person they'll tell you to be a good human being thank you gelek for coming oh it's my pleasure <laughs> because you are from such a special place mm-hmm. that maybe we all you kind of knew about it because of the movie three idiots mm-hmm. ladak you are from there and you you were born and grew up there yes true before this recording started we were talking about your hometown maybe you can share a little bit more about what's it like what's it called and how you live there okay sure well uh, my hometown it's called ladak le ladak the place where i live is le le is the capital city not i would say not city but a small town mm-hmm. and le is the main center that is where i live and ladakh is a big region actually so ladakh is a high altitude region more than 3000 to 3500 meter above sea level mm-hmm. and it's a mountain region and very different from taiwan and other part of the other part of the world actually because it's a cold desert actually mm-hmm. very dry lots of barren land and very harsh weather i would say summer is pleasant but winter is very harsh sometimes it goes to minus 20 when it minus 25 that is normal uh-huh. during winter and we have uh, very less precipitation less rainfall less snowfall but of course it does when people say that uh, your place must be cold they have a impression that uh, we have lots of snowfall Snow. but yeah. that is not true we have lots of uh, like you know um, windy places lots uh-huh. of wind during night morning but uh, snowfall i would say during winter season maybe maximum four five times uh-huh but of course uh, if you go to the higher places uh, like high passes mountains there will be snow all the time uh-huh. especially during winters but uh, not at the places where we live people live you know so so do people get excited to get snowfall uh it does actually it's not they don't get excited just because they get to see snowfall it's a high altitude desert so water is the main concern for people you know uh-huh. because uh ah. the source of water uh, for people living in the mountains i think all over the world actually except the sea area uh-huh. the source of water is the glacier uh-huh. and that is where the water comes from you know uh-huh. so when we get to see snow people get excited because the next coming summer is going to be you prosperous have... we will have not a uh, problem with the water uh-huh. otherwise uh, especially those people who are dependent on farming you know yeah so they will have a tough time if there is no snowfall yeah so because uh, whatever rainfall we get during summer that is not enough and considering the timing also that is not suitable for farming you know uh-huh. so because normally when we need a water we need a water for the initial period of the farming which is uh, the sp- spring time uh-huh. march april so that time there's no there's no chance of rainfall so we have to depend on the snow which was stored during winter you know so that oh, will start melting uh-huh. and that is how people get excited about snow but obviously i think younger generation for the aesthetic reason because when it snow it looks better so maybe yeah, they get excited the but white. but the older generation because of different reason they get mm-hmm. excited so then actually in le including your drinking water or the water usage or for farming everything is based on the snow or glacier yes true i see so you also mentioned that farming was a big part of Um, maybe the old older generation or yes. so what do you plant the major crop actually i would say barley barley and uh-huh. wheat wheat uh, those are the staple crop but uh, mm-hmm. in uh, when it comes to vegetable mostly uh, turnip and in terms of fruit we have uh, apricot and apple those are oh. the major one because uh, oh, right. as we know that apricot or the good quality apricot it grows in a higher altitude you know even the apple you know? i see so we have uh, and some sort of uh, walnut also we have walnut in certain places but again if i say like uh, it uh, this kind of crop grows in every part of ladakh that would be wrong because uh, in ladakh also we 
when I say we have th uh, more than 3,000 uh, higher altitude region, so there are certain villages which is more than 4,000 also. At those places, uh, the, even apricot, apple doesn't grow. Uh -huh. Only on the lower elevated uh, places, uh -huh. we have this kind of crop. You know? I see. So it could, I could not say like it's a general uh, crop for all over the places. It depends on region to region. Uh -huh. But since we are like sparsely populated area, uh -huh. so some villages have a good uh, yield of farming. Uh -huh. But yeah. some places which are on a very high altitude, like uh, the mostly people know about three areas and they, you must have seen that Pangong area, which is a very high altitude area. Uh -huh. So those kind of region doesn't have any sort of vegetation, maybe... A scanty shrubs or some cactus, etc., but not uh, uh, the kind of farming normally people does in other part of the region. Mm -hmm. you know? I see. So they are those kind of uh, in that uh, particular places, people are mostly dependent on cattle rearing. They are called nomads, you know, uh -huh. shifting from one place to another uh, to seek a pasture land. Uh -huh. So we have those kind of people also, but they are also some sort of farming actually, but I it's see. not exactly. Uh, yeah, like agriculture farming, but the livestock farming. You know? I see. For your family, I know your family is not farming, right? No. So, uh, when when you say like my family is from farming or non farming, because uh, originally uh, all the people from Ladakh, uh, maybe I would say thirty years back, mm -hmm. we were all into farming mm -hmm. because uh, Ladakh being a very like tough kind of terrain, mm -hmm. uh, we were not much connected to other other part of the world, you know, mm -hmm. because we live in a place where it's all surrounded by high passes, high mountains. Yeah. So in that, uh, during that time, maybe I would say 50 years back, uh, our society was very self-sufficient. You know? uh -huh. We cannot depend on other other part of the world, especially when you're living in a places like uh, Taiwan, which is a coastal area. Yeah. Everything is easily accessible, you know. Mm -hmm. But for us, actually... Um, we are connected to other part of the world by through me two means. One is through by air, yeah, uh, which is uh, not affordable for everybody. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we are connected with other part of the world through road. But again, uh, to get to plains of India, there are passes, high mountain passes, which are to be crossed. Yeah. So which uh, normally gets remain shut during winter time. Uh, so it makes total sense. So for like. In olden times, at least for seven, eight months, uh, we would be completely cut off from the rest of the world, uh -huh. except by air. So yeah. because of that, you know, everybody were dependent on farming, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, because you need to yes. yeah, farm food for yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to be self-sufficient. And then, I mean, airplane didn't show up soon within these hundreds of years. So then if you don't take the airplane, mm -hmm. how far would be... Would it be the travel between there to the next big city? Next big city, I would say in olden times was Srinagar, mm -hmm. which is a part of Kashmir, which is the capital of Jammu and Kashmir. Mm -hmm. So in olden times, I think if we did not have a mean of communication, especially like a motor vehicle or aeroplane, mm -hmm. then people would uh, go on a horseback, I think, probably. So my grand-grand-grand-grand-grand-grandfathers, mm -hmm. I think they would travel on a horseback. Uh -huh. And my grandfather used to tell us that it would take at least months to reach to another uh, cities like Srinagar. Mm -hmm. Or uh, when, before 1947, uh, before this uh, Chinese revolution or Tibet become a part of China. So we were connected to Tibet and people uh, used to go to Tibet, you know, from uh, like eastern part of Ladakh is connected to Tibet. So uh, people from Ladakh would uh, have a trading facilities with people from Tibet, Central mm -hmm. Asia. Yeah. So it would take at least months, I'm sure. Because and and most of the voyages have to be taken during summer only. Winter is yeah. not possible. I haven't experienced, but my grandfather used to say it would take months. At least two, three months to reach that place mm -hmm. and again to come back. You know, it, mm -hmm. it would be very tough. Wow. It's hard to imagine. That. Wait, so nowadays do you have train? Can you take train? Uh, no, we don't have train. The nearest railway station to our place is around 750 kilometers from Ladakh. That is in Jammu. In India, that is the northernmost train station. I that is see. called Jammu Tawi. And uh -huh. yeah, it's quite, quite far from Ladakh. So will there be a train station? Is it technically possible? Mm, 
or so far airplane Consi- is like the best? Considering the technology what we have today, mm-hmm. it is possible because we have seen the same kind of, uh, we have the same kind of terrain in uh, many parts of Tibet mm-hmm. and they like they have a train. Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe we like our even even our Indian government is planning to have a train connectivity to Ladakh, but but it seems like a distant dream, you know. Mm-hmm. I think it was going to take time, at least maybe minimum fifteen to twenty years. I see. Mm, I also want to ask, what does your family do? Oh uh, well, my father was in army, mm-hmm. was an ex army, and later on. After he took a uh, voluntary retirement because he wanted to take care of me and my brother. And so, you know, because in our, when, when you're in army, you're away from your family. So he took a voluntary retirement. After that, he started a local dress shop. So he owns uh-huh. a local dress shop. Uh-huh. And my mom, uh, she worked in a government office, uh-huh. power company, uh-huh. which is owned by a government. And recently she got retired. So you all live in Le. For uh, yes, the whole time of your life. Mm, true. Did you go to school, university, mm, also school. in your city? Uh, for us, for my school, I went to school in LA. Mm-hmm. But uh, after like higher school, I went to other part of India. Uh huh. So same with my brother. So because in LA, actually, it's being a small place. Uh, when we were kids, uh, the facilities was not that good as compared to other part of the cities. So most of the students they would go outside, you know, mm-hmm. after especially for higher studies. So actually, even in India, mm-hmm. you grew up in a very remote or special place. Then when you go to university to meet with others, mm-hmm. do you feel your your experience growing up in Ladakh is um, really different or? How would you compare these two experiences? I would say it's a complete cultural shock for us when we first stepped out of Ladakh, and you know. How old were you? Uh, I was fifteen, sixteen, I think. Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, when we first time when we went out of Ladakh, it was different because uh, when people say that uh, you know, I'm from India. They think that uh, India, all over India, people would have same kind of culture, same kind of tradition, which mm-hmm. is not true, because India is very diverse, you know. Yeah. So for people living in Delhi, the this is where I spend my six, seven years of graduation, you know. Yeah. So for people living in Delhi, for them, people coming from Ladakh is coming from a different country, you know. Uh-huh. Since India is very big. Yeah. Same impression would be something like. Uh, people coming from Delhi to when they come to Ladakh, mm-hmm. we also have a same impression that okay, they're from different part of the country, and somewhat uh, racially, ethnically, they are different. You know, mm-hmm. so that is that is the first impression we had uh, when I stepped out of Ladakh. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I would say again, there's a good part, bad part also, mm-hmm. because good part is that you get to see a different part of the world. Mm-hmm. You get to have lots of exposure. Mm-hmm. There are many good things about big cities, mm-hmm. which we have never experienced in our life. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there are many bad things also. Like uh, we have never experienced that kind of pollution, that kind of crowd. Uh, and especially coming from Ladakh, uh, other part of India is very hot. You know, uh, So right. we have never experienced that. And then hot and humid climate was like, initially it was like hell. Uh-huh. Very difficult to manage. And India being, a, being a, such a big country, sometimes you get some sort of racial discrimination also. Uh-huh. Because by looks, you look different from the mainlander Indians. Uh-huh. So Wait, mainlander Indians are like the Sassam part? or uh, I would say their complexions are different. Mm-hmm. Their features are different. The way they speak, the language is different. And we normally, we look like um, Orientals. Uh huh. Because people coming from mountain area have a different features. Yeah, and also so, ancestries. Too. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes we get racially abused, but not every day. Mm-hmm. And it all depends on your attitude also. Yeah. If you gel well with them, you're you're good. Mm-hmm. But if you try to stay away from them or try to keep aloof, you know, then you might have to face discrimination. You know. Mm-hmm. So that is not a very serious issue. But at the at one hand, I would say. Sometimes people treat you differently 
it i think it gives you opportunity to make you make yourself better also mm mm-hmm. there's a challenges but uh, they say like <laughs> when you have challenges at the end of the day when you overcome that challenge you feel better you know yeah. you turn out to be a better person so for me actually i did not face that much problem let's come back to talk about your family a little bit more cuz i come from taipei you have been here for multiple times already so you're used to the place and our concept our background or the way we think about things are really different so how's it like to grow up in your family in your hometown and for example like what kind of people do your family or your society expect or encourage you to be so actually i would say coming from a small town small place our lifestyle is very different uh-huh. i would say compared to taipei yeah so because you live in a very like modern society i would say ultra modern for us actually uh-huh. oh and uh, out here what i have observed that people are very disciplined everything is very systematic Mm-hmm. Sometimes I like with uh, jokingly I tell Cindy that I find it very robotic. Uh-huh. Uh the way everything has been going around me, you know. Yeah. Because uh, in my place I would not say it's complete chaos, but things are very different. It's not very disciplined. Mhm. But there's a saying in um, India. I'm talking about India. They say there's order in the chaos. Mm-hmm. Even if everything is is in chaos, but there's some order in that. But in your place everything is very much in order. So initially when I came here first impression was very good but every day when you go through the same process you know I find it very robotic uh-huh. it's not that I'm complaining but I'm comparing with my place yeah yeah because in my place uh you want to go in open area you do whatever you want you know mm-hmm. there's not much restriction mm-hmm. in what in one way it is good in one way I would say it's bad also mm-hmm. of course in every society you grow Oh, because of the background, because of the upbringing, there's expectation. Mm-hmm. But since my place, people are we follow Tibetan Buddhism, so it teaches a lot about kind, compassionate, you know, mm-hmm. uh, be a good human being. So actually, when we grow up, uh, the first important thing our parents tell us is not to be a successful person or a rich person. They'll tell you to be a good human being. Mm-hmm. They always talk about compassion, kindness. be good to others mhm uh, be good to um, even the animals be good to any living beings you know mhm so being, being being born in a buddhist buddhist family mhm so that is how we grew up but again uh, when things started getting modernized yeah the concept of uh, being successful concept of uh, being academically successful or getting a higher post in the government ranks yeah. or becoming rich uh now things are changing you know uh-huh. so this this concept is coming up now I so see. i would say uh, in my in my lifetime mm-hmm. 30 40 years mm-hmm. i've seen many changes actually mm-hmm. initially when we were kids uh, there would be very less competition uh uh-huh. among the parents also among the kids also when we used to go to school it was very completely carefree but this day when i see younger kids going to school they have more competition mm-hmm. they have more expectation Mm-hmm. So that is what I have been seeing. That is my observation is all about you know. So when you were kids, there is not that much competition, and it's mostly like very carefree school days. Yes, very carefree, and uh, we did not have the kind of facilities you have now. Mm-hmm. But still, I would say I think I don't know because I haven't lived both the lives, you know. Mm-hmm. But my as a third party. observation you know when i see the, the kids of today in my place i'm not talking about the other mm-hmm. societies you know yeah i see they have more facilities yeah in terms of materialistic things yeah but uh, i would say if given a choice i would choose the childhood i had you know compared uh, I, to them. i will too <laughs> yeah because we had a simple things but we would cherish a lot you know Did you have to take like a college entrance exam or mm. how how do you get into high school and universities Actually um, there's this uh, I think in every region or every country there is some technical and non-technical kind of education you know uh-huh. So in India also when you want to get admission into technical colleges 
like engineering, doctor, etc. Mm -hmm. Then we have to take a competition, mm -hmm. competitive exam. Yeah. But for the non-technical colleges, we don't have to take any competitive exams. But again, if you they would consider about your score mm -hmm. in the ranking, which you would have in your previous you know classes. Yeah. So according to that ranking, you would get a good college. Oh, there would be a ranking in the college also, mm -hmm. number one, number two, number three, like that. Ah, so accordingly, we would get. But India is a very, especially when it comes to education, mm -hmm. the competition is very tough. And it's getting tougher. Yes, very tough. Tougher and tougher. And then there are some schools, I don't know the system in Taiwan, but uh, there are some schools in Delhi, some big cities, mm -hmm. where getting an admission even parents has to go through some examination. They have yeah. to go through some interview. So, you know, they will check the background of the parents if they are educated enough. Yeah. Uh, what is their upbringing? Only then the kids will be getting admission. But fortunately, in my place, we don't have that system yet. Mm -hmm. But maybe in the coming days, it would happen. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if everything is sort of interviewed or censored, mm -hmm. then... Similar people or people will stay in the same class mm -hmm. or because people with more resources, they will be able to do things that's beneficial for them. But whereas people with less resources, they won't be able to get into that school or meet different group of people. Then everybody is just in an enclosed group. True. It will. It, I think uh, if this kind of system prevails, you know, then it will give uh, more encouragement to the class division, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. And then also earlier you mentioned that India in general, the the gap between the rich and poor is huge. But then uh, for where you're from, mm -hmm. it's not as huge. You mentioned that everybody has uh, their home and they have a place to live. So when you come to Taiwan, I guess I want to ask, like, uh, you mentioned about the robotic or the very automatic, systematic thing. Mm -hmm. So what are the other culture shock or huge differences between these different places you've visited? First of all, I would say the kind of facilities you have here, mm -hmm. it's completely unimaginable imaginable for people like us you know mm -hmm. and because everything is so systematic everything is so convenient at some time like i could not believe myself that how could things would be so systematic for example for example you go out you hardly see any dust on the street because coming from my place it's very dry mm -hmm. so we have dust oh. everywhere you know uh -huh. no matter how much effort you put on uh -huh. Like, for example, for instance, I'll give you one example. If you go for a car washing in my place, the moment you finish your car washing and you step out and drive for five minutes, your car will be covered with, again, dust, you know. So in your place, if you go for car washing, I think maybe for 10, 15 days, you don't need to worry about anything, you know. This is the kind of system I mm -hmm. see. Secondly, because since uh, your place are like more developed than ours, Mm -hmm. So every facilities, especially the transport system, I would say, and the facilities, everything, everywhere you go, you come across a departmental store like 7-Eleven. But in my place, if you want to go for some shopping, something like that, you have to travel a certain distance, you know. Mm -hmm. And since uh, your place is like very highly densely populated, so mm -hmm. maybe that is the one reason that you have such kind of facilities everywhere. But mm -hmm. in my place, uh, if you go to one village to another village, Mm -hmm. There's a distance of at least 10-15 kilometer, and in the middle, you will not see a single person on the road. Mm -hmm. So in that kind of situation, those kind of facilities are not possible also. I can understand the situation, mm -hmm. but uh, these are the things, you know, this is the difference uh, you get to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, I think people here are like, maybe it's because of your cultural background or maybe... People are so busy into their own life. I feel that they are very friendly and they don't care about each other life that much, you know. Uh -huh. They're least bothered. Actually, once you're going to a metro or something, people doesn't have a time to look at each other also, to greet each other also. But in my place, it's different, different, you know. 
in my place if we go to some mountain hiking also we see each other we greet we say hi hello we have interaction you know uh-huh. out here i don't see that much of interaction maybe it's a part of the culture i don't uh-huh know. but in my place if you meet a stranger on the bus on a public transport they'll say hi hello where are you from or maybe which family do you belong to maybe in my because in my place there's one interesting fact i'll tell you in your place we have a address about your house house number which floor yeah in my place we don't have house number which floor we have a house name or a family name so when you send me a letter you have to write my name and my family name and the location there's no house number there's no floor oh so, so they will find you based on like location yes. family and you belong and, to this family yes that is how the post postal office will find you uh huh but yeah now the things are changing now you have a office you have a a uh, business establishment like shop other things then we have some numbers something like that coming but when it comes to sending a post a letter to a village you know mm-hmm. then you have to write the family name mm-hmm. so i was coming back to the point i'm saying that when when we go to some kind of festival some kind of gathering mm-hmm. people meet each other mm-hmm. and our place people are very friendly actually maybe they are very innocent i would say if for example if i go to some place i i give a lift to somebody in my car Mm. We talk a lot. Yeah. We try to find out who who the other person is, you know. Like your common friends yes. or and then especially the elder people they'll ask you a lot. <laughs> Where are you from? Who's your father? Who's your mother? Or which family do you belong to? Oh, I know your father. I know your father. That kind of interaction we have, yeah. you know. But out here when I say it's like robotic, robotic is like, you know, uh, there's not much human connection. That is what yeah. I feel it is missing in yeah. uh, big cities. Yeah. But it's not only about Taipei. It's everywhere in the world I feel. Yeah, I think big cities in the relationship we kind of trade something out to get the convenience mm-hmm. or like the efficiencies that people are not as close or not as um yeah, we don't have that much interaction anymore. Yes. Yeah, so then so for example if you meet with someone mm-hmm. someone new in your hometown mm-hmm. then the first thing that you will perhaps ask them is like who is your family or we say where are you from where are you from that is how we dress so for example like if i ask you where are you from what will you say i would say uh i would say my family village name first Uh-huh. Because when I say I'm from Lei that um, because It's I'm big. not originally from Lei. Oh. Lei is the main town that is where we live but uh, my village is around 135 km from Lei mm-hmm. which is called Domkar. Domkar. So when I meet some new people I will say I will say I'm from Domkar mm-hmm. and then secondly they will ask you because Domkar has many families you know uh-huh. maybe around 60 70 100 families. Yeah. So say they will say which family. So I will tell my family name then they will know everything. Okay. They would know yes. already because it's a small town. I said the place where I live, Lei itself, you know, the the town, it doesn't have more than forty, thirty five to forty thousand population, which is very less. Yeah. And then there's one incident, you know, like every time Cindy comes to visit me. Yeah. And when I go to the market, because we don't have many markets, we uh-huh. have one or two big market where normally people go for a shopping or to hang out, you know. So when I just uh, when we are just in the market going for shopping and then i would at least meet 40 50 people which i know say hi hello how are you <laughs> so cindy once she first time when she when she came to lay so i took her to the market yeah. i met so many people like it's a normal routine for us actually yeah. we say hi hello how are you everything then cindy told me oh you seems to be very famous you know everybody i said it's not only about me it's about everybody uh-huh. we know each other everyone you know Uh-huh. and it's Almost, a routine it's a routine uh-huh. so that is how you know things work so how often do you go to the market actually <laughs> since i have my restaurant in market so i go every day oh so and every I day meet, you you greet everyone yes almost everyone wow <laughs> so that is how i feel connected to my place connected yeah. to people you know you feel like you are living among the people you know mm-hmm. but if you go to a market and you don't see anybody known to you you feel kind of strange you know? mm-hmm. so for for me when i'm here i feel somewhat strange and sometimes deep within you know i feel like saying ni hao to somebody on the street yeah. as a stranger but i feel like maybe 
it's not appropriate to say hello or mm-hmm. say ni hao or if i some if i see some old lady doing something i feel like going and saying oh do you need help but again i don't know if it is appropriate culturally appropriate or not you know i think it's okay but again the problem is that i don't speak their language so yeah. maybe they might not feel comfortable so that is the case you know mm-hmm. so you know like when i grew up in taipei well actually nowadays we still have those traditional market mm-hmm. that you have food vendors in a, the same building mm-hmm. and that i remember when i was really little following my grandma to the market mm-hmm. then she would always visit the same pork vendor or the fish vendor mm-hmm. and then they will they will have like short conversation with each other this is of course a very different shopping experience comparing to going to the supermarket, supermarket. because supermarket you pick up all your own stuff and then just go to the cashier mm-hmm. and you have like minimum or the least interaction mm-hmm. with human beings and this kind of has become the standard for city people i guess because mm-hmm. everybody is working you're always busy so you need to you have limited amount of time mm-hmm. that you need to do your shopping as fast as you could yes. so then you sacrifice or you give up um uh, all the opportunities to actually have more interaction to slow down and to know each other better so yeah that's disappearing unfortunately <laughs> i think that will happen to my place also maybe after 30 40 years really now do you I have it it does a trend you know because like you talked about your grandma mhm during her time it yeah. would be different mhm now if if she was here today mm-hmm. she would see a different experience. Mm-hmm. same thing i would be talking down the land when maybe after 20 30 years mm-hmm. i would also tell our kids or our grand children that mm-hmm. things used to be like that you know yeah i think it's not uh, only about taiwan or any other big city yeah it's but, a huge uh, you know it's going to be trend. the same all over the world mm-hmm. this is actually it's happening I've seen from my own experience I was talking about the younger generation yeah this day in my place also younger generation doesn't know forget about knowing their neighbors or the play, people from their own community mm-hmm. they don't know their cousins also there are incidents uh-huh. like that I, see. i have my own nephew niece who doesn't know me uh-huh i have, they don't know each other they don't know their cousins you know because they live far away uh now that uh, or they don't the have nuclear, time to meet nuclear kind of family you know city kind of family uh-huh it's more you know getting into trend actually in olden uh, times it used to be mostly joint family yeah so where every sibling every cousin they would interact they would at least live together yeah so now in my place also especially the town where i live mm-hmm. the, that nuclear family is you know it's it's getting into trend actually but currently you and your parents and your brother mm-hmm. are living together right yes we are living together and then you mentioned that maybe you will li- uh, look for a bigger property to have bigger space mm, yes because uh, now that family is expanding mm-hmm. so we are just thinking that maybe the space is not enough mm-hmm. even though we think it, it's enough mm. but being a human being nothing is enough all <laughs> right so then when cindy comes yeah most likely you will all stay in one house yes. and moving to together to mm-hmm. a bigger house uh, we are planning Uh-huh. But again, if I say like uh, living in a one house, mm-hmm. like your place, you live in an apartment, one floor, two floor. So in my place also, it's the same thing. We have two floor and then ground floor, mostly like we have a living room, kitchen, everything. Mm-hmm. And then the first floor, we have a bedroom, living one more living room where normally we sit together, watch TV together like that. I remember you have a special, is it for special ceremony or praying or... There is a Some special prayer, room in your room. Oh. Uh actually it's not exactly a special room in my family but it is everywhere in the society where mm-hmm. we live especially for uh, people following Buddhism because uh-huh. in my place we have a uh, people following Buddhism also we yeah. have Muslim families also mm-hmm. and since we know about Muslim they don't do idol worship uh-huh. so they don't have particular place in a house where they pray but yeah. we have it in every house we we will have to have it. one house for praying 
So, how do you use the room? Uh, normally, it is the place where normally we place the god, uh-huh. god as in Buddha. Yeah, statue of Buddha and the prayers, offerings, food offerings, and uh, this uh, we call it some lamp offering. You know, mm-hmm. some butter lamp. Yeah, and uh, we do that praying pro uh, prostration you know? every day. Every day. We are supposed to do, but yeah. uh, since <laughs> we are the younger generation, we don't do that much often. Uh-huh. But my parents, uh, they make sure, like especially my mom and dad, they get up early in the morning, five thirty, six thirty, and they do at least fifty hundred of prostration every day. I see. And they spend time because uh, spirituality. Uh, I think when people get old, you know. Mm-hmm. They give more importance to spirituality. Yes. So that is why I felt because my parents, when I when they were younger, I did not see them praying that much. Since oh. now that they're, they're getting older, they are becoming more devoted to uh-huh. God or you know spirituality. So uh-huh. I see them spending more and more time, and and in 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 one way it is good actually. Uh huh. Because you feel connected. You know? Yeah. And it gives you inner satisfaction. So yeah, we don't mind. And when they spend more time for a prayer, mm-hmm. we normally encourage them. You know? uh-huh. And you will feel more calm as well. Ah, uh, yes, true. Yeah. So wait for it. You'll be in that think, stage too. Yes, we will be for sure. Uh-huh. I also have a lot of question for you about your work, mm-hmm. which I know you have a traveling agency and mm-hmm. also a restaurant, mm-hmm. and also doing something together with your brother. Oh uh, yes. Actually, that is the difference between, you know, mm-hmm. older generation and younger generation. Because in olden times, people f- would do farming and they are very much content with that. You know, they are very, very much satisfied. Mm-hmm. But since I'm from a, like, compared to them, I'm from a modern family, modern generation. Yeah. So now, especially in my place, it is going through a transition phase now, I mm-hmm. would say. Because 30 years back, there was not much opportunity. Uh-huh. Now more and more opportunities are coming up, uh-huh. which uh, which are making us more busy actually. Uh-huh. So that is how I have like two, three jobs. And because, uh, for me, frankly speaking, you know, when I'm right now here for a vacation, so I don't do much of things. Yeah. But when I'm home, I'm like more like a work workaholic. Uh-huh. I don't like to stay at one place and do nothing, you know. Uh-huh. I just want to do something, keep myself busy. Uh-huh. So I feel happy in that. It's not because... I have a greed for money or something, mm-hmm. but I feel inner satisfaction when I do something and I achieve something. You know? Yeah. So that is how, like Cindy always tell me, like, don't do so many things, try to focus on one thing or something, you know. Mm-hmm. But I like doing things, doing new things. You know? Yeah. So whenever I see an opportunity, I just try to grab that. The end result, I don't know mm-hmm. whether you can be a successful, not successful, but there should not be a regret that you do not try. You know? Yeah, exactly. So that is I. That is how I try to keep busy, mm-hmm. and every year I try to do something new, get into some new venture. And frankly speaking, some have some have been successful, some have not been successful, but still, mm-hmm. there's no regret, you know. Yeah. So right now, currently, I have a, a travel agency, mm-hmm. which is my oldest business, I would say. Did you start it right after school? Oh uh, no, I started in 2012. Twelve. Before that. Uh, Actually, in small society, uh-huh. people would say that when you have a government job, uh-huh. they think it's a big thing. Uh-huh. So, my parents they wanted to do want, wanted me to get into a government job. So, which I tried, I got selected also, but I did not do it. You know, I did not join it later on. Ah, uh-huh. because I wanted to do something of my own. You know, what did you major in college? Major, I don't actually. I don't know the concept of major, you know, because we have a graduation. Oh. And after that, you have a post graduation. Uh huh. So graduation is mine is commerce, oh. bachelor of commerce. commerce. But after that, I did not follow the same stream. Uh huh. And I did a master's in history and tourism management. Oh, I see. Because uh, I was quite interested in history. Mm-hmm. So yeah, because when you are a teenager, your uh, interest keeps on changing. You know. So yeah, after exactly. my school, I wanted to, to do a study about business more. Uh-huh. And after studying business for like three years in a graduation, yeah, I feel okay, now it's enough. I should study about history. Then mm-hmm. I get into history. 
So actually, starting the traveling agency is kind of combining what you're interested in and what you studied. Oh、uh, yes, kind of. So how how's the business? What what kind of tour do you offer? Especially, it's inbound tourist. Uh huh.、Uh, and my travel agency is mostly limited to Ladakh area only,、mm -hmm. and、uh, we don't do much of tour beyond Ladakh. Mm -hmm. But sometimes、uh, combining with Ladakh, if somebody wants to see、uh, places like Delhi,、mm -hmm. Taj Mahal, other other places,、mm -hmm. we do arrange for that kind of tour. You know,、mm -hmm. but again,、uh, Ladakh, especially in the domestic circuit, you know, in India, it's、uh, one of the most famous destination.、Mm -hmm. So we get enough of tourists, especially after、uh, three years movie. Yeah, I was gonna ask, did、mm -hmm. it bring you a lot of travelers? I would say, in terms of business, it is good. If you ask me the experience after three years, yeah. But again, if you see from the environmental point of view,、mm. again they have brought so many tourists,、yeah. especially to the place like Pangong, so Pangong area, yeah, which is、uh, like very remote, yeah, and which needs to be very clean, yeah. But、uh, unfortunately,、mm. after three years, lots of tourists. Some would say, I would say, some are very responsible, or some are irresponsible. There are different kind of people in the world, yeah. So. There's some issues are there,、ah, after, especially after three years. I look it up. The Three Idiots was published in two thousand nine, I think. Nine ten years. Yeah. So then it's actually like a turning point. But before that, Ladakh is a famous tourist was,、uh, attraction. Actually, if you see the history of tourism in Ladakh, you can divide into two phases. No. Uh huh. Uh, Ladakh was open to tourism in nineteen seventy four. Oh, way back in 1974, but that time it was famous mostly among the European tourists、oh, for adventure、yeah. destination, you know,、uh -huh. because being a mountain area,、yeah. being somewhat similar to China, because、uh, no Tibet, because、yeah. Tibet, Tibet being a part of China, it was not very much open to the world, you know. Yes. So people would look at Ladakh as an alternative to Tibet, you know. I see. So that's why on your PowerPoint you wrote down the old Tibet. Ah、uh, yeah, it's it is called Little Tibet actually. Oh, people fondly they call it Little Tibet because we have so much similarity with the Tibet.、Mm -hmm. So especially Westerner、uh -huh. initially they 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 would have like you no, know, find it like Tibet. So they call it Little Tibet. So if I walk down the street in the, are there a lot of tourists or Westerners? Ah、uh, yes, but now that's what I was talking about. You know, we have two phase of. Tourism history of tourism. If you、yeah. study from 1974 to 1999, before three years,、mm -hmm. I would say it was a period of Western tourism. Yeah,、uh, foreign. We we call it foreign and domestic tourism. You know,、uh -huh. so it was a phase of foreign tourist. But after three years, when Ladakh was, uh, uh, it became popular all over the world. Yeah, as well as in India. You know. Uh huh. So after that, lots of Indian tourists, domestic tourists. Yeah, they have started coming. Mm -hmm. So that phase, I would say, it is a phase of domestic tourist. But again,、oh. uh, I would not be like prejudiced about the people, but、um, the way Westerners and the way、uh, Indians tourist,、yeah. their travel is different. You know,、uh -huh. how different?、Uh, Westerner tourists are very like I would not tell, I would not call them tourists. I would call them travelers. They are、uh -huh. very well educated. Uh huh. They have seen the world. Mm -hmm. They they have a different expectation.、Mm -hmm. They have different、uh, set of、uh, you know preparation.、Mm -hmm. But when I say domestic tourist,、mm -hmm. I would not generalize like hundred percent or same.、Mm -hmm. But mostly domestic tourist,、uh, they just want to go and see the explore the place. They just want to take a photograph, enjoy,、mm -hmm. and they don't they don't care much about the culture or stories, culture respecting culture, you know. So they have like different level of tourists.、Mm -hmm. So, but the unfortunate thing about tourism in Ladakh is that,、uh, especially the Western tourists,、mm -hmm. they don't like the place which is very noisy,、uh -huh. which is very crowded. Yeah. So, but the places like、uh, after three years,、uh -huh. uh, Ladakh, certain part of places, it's become very crowded. Yeah. So the Western Western tourists have started avoiding coming to places. Oh, because they know it's getting crowded, and、yes. they want to avoid.、Mm -hmm. So that is why in my place, actually, we have a short tourist season, starting from April till end of September. Yeah. But fortunately, what is happening is like we we could manage to divide into two parts. Uh huh. 
from April till end of June. Uh-huh. We call it as a time of domestic tourists oh. because in India, other part of India, the plain India, yeah, uh, May and June is summer season, yeah. peak summer season, uh-huh. and most of the people they get summer holidays. Uh-huh. So that is the time most of the people from India they would visit Ladakh. Uh-huh. And July, August, September, uh-huh. foreign tourists will come because they know that that time they will be less crowded. I see. So we have like two kind of seasons. So if me and my family and my friends, like your Taiwanese mm-hmm. friends who are interested in visiting you in Ladakh, then you will suggest us to go to July. Okay. Word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So then, for your traveling agency, do you? Plan these tour or destinations for both domestic tour and uh, foreign tours. Yes, we do, and there will be a different set of itineraries also because the mm, preferences will be different. The domestic tourists want to see something else, yeah, and the foreign tourists they want to see something else. You know? So, what is like the longest trip that you have planned for your customer? Mm. How 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 many days do people usually stay there? Uh, it depends. Actually, if the tour we offer mm-hmm. shortest is around four night five days. Yeah, and the longest uh, I've offered so far is around twelve to fourteen days. Oh, because Ladakh is very big. Actually, in, if yeah, you, if you if we talk about the area in the geographical condition, you know, yeah, uh, Ladakh is around forty five thousand square meter. Okay, I have no sense. Almost, of almost size. Uh, same as Taiwan, or maybe a little bit bigger than Taiwan in terms of area. Mm-hmm. But the population is vastly populated, and we don't have population more than three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand people, mm-hmm. which is very less. I think maybe in your in places like Taiwan, mm-hmm. I think in one apartment which is like around thirty forty story, mm-hmm. more people live in one particular building than our whole area. Mm. Especially the building that you are staying in yes. right now. That's a huge apartment building. That's a huge building. apartment. That's what I was telling Cindy. You know. Uh huh. I think in my uh, because the place where I live is Lay, and in Lay particular something like you have this Banchao other places you know so my place is called Choklam Sir Choklam Sir Choklam Sir which is around five kilometer from Lay uh-huh. city yeah so the place where I live is maybe around we have two hundred three hundred families uh huh and the, the day I asked Cindy like how many people are there how many people would be in the same building. She was saying maybe around four hundred, five hundred families. Then I said, like, we are, we are living in a place which is more densely populated than the, my whole area. Yeah, your the four hundred families for from your hometown is spread. Yes, but it's then quite spread. in Taipei, it's like in the whole vertically, vertically, vertically and horizontally <laughs> spread. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. So, what are the challenges now for you to do the traveling agency? Challenges actually. Uh, in terms of resources, mm-hmm. I would say, because uh, there are many opportunities of tourism, mm-hmm. and but the thing is that connectivity is the main challenge. Oh, you mean like transportation? Transportation, because uh, when we have a flight yeah. from Delhi or other part of cities, other part of India, like we are connected to three, four, three or four cities of other part of India, you know. Uh-huh. But uh, the limitation is that we don't have so many flights. Uh-huh. Maybe in a day around maximum seven eight flights uh-huh. in a day. Yeah. So seven eight flight means around one thousand people can yeah. come. Yeah. So that is one challenge, uh-huh. and uh, we have a very small airport. Uh huh. Now that the government is you know, building building bigger one. Uh huh. And secondly, the road transportation coming to Ladakh means uh, the nearest railway station we were talking yeah. about. From there, if you drive, it will take at least two days. Two days. Because uh, when people say like I when I say that it will take two days, people find it very ridiculous. You know, they're thinking how come is seven just fifty kilometer? But when you're driving on a mountain area, on right. a high passes, yeah, uh, you have to drive slow. Yeah, and during night time, there's a chance of snowfall. Yeah, if something happens on the way, there's no backup. You know, yeah, so people does not drive during night time. Only during daytime, I uh, see. traveling is possible. You know. Uh huh. So that is those. That is the one big challenge. So is all the capacity? I mean, one thousand tourists each day mm-hmm. during the traveling season. It's, I guess, it will be filled up quite quickly. Yes, and it becomes expensive also. 
Mm-hmm. Just for one hour flight, uh, I don't know what is the standard out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has to be, it should be around 50, 60 dollars should be the standard one, you know, USD. Mm-hmm. But sometime in summer when it's a peak season, it goes to 100, 200 dollars also, which is very expensive for the tourists to come. You know? mm-hmm. I know you also have a restaurant in Le. Yes, and I do. How how's the restaurant business? Mm, well, it's good. But during COVID time, it was a bit challenging mm-hmm. for some time. Mm-hmm. But now things are getting back to normal. So it's better than before. I, I'm curious. So for COVID, what was it like in your hometown? Uh, well, initially for 45 days, the whole India, it was under lockdown, complete uh-huh. lockdown. Uh-huh. So 44, 45 days, uh, my restaurant was completely shut down. That was in 20... 2020. Beginning uh-huh. of March 24th. Uh-huh. That was the day when our Prime Minister declared that there will be a complete lockdown uh-huh. in the country. Yeah. So from March 24th onwards, for 45 days, we were closed. And after that, initially things started opening. Uh-huh. And we made some effort to get some permission for the home delivery. So yeah. that is how we started. Because uh, for us, because uh, my... Oh, most of my staff are not from Ladakh. Uh-huh. They're from outside of Ladakh. So yeah. since there was a sudden kind of lockdown, so yeah. I could not send them back to their hometown. The challenging part was we were like paying them the salary, their accommodation, everything, expenses. If the situation was longer, it would be difficult for us to support. Yeah. But after some time, we were given a permission, you know. Uh-huh. to do home delivery uh-huh. so that some somehow we got back to track uh, I see so then after the four, 45 days of lockdown so I guess there will be times that you were still doing home deliveries but at the same time your restaurant is opened again no it was not open only we were like uh, allowed to open kitchen uh-huh. nobody was allowed to visit our restaurant except the delivery boys would go to the places for home delivery Mm-hmm. That is how we started. Mm-hmm. It, even though it was not profitable, but at least uh, it was paying for somewhat for our losses, you know. I see. What kind of food do you sell in a restaurant? Well, <laughs> we do serve many cuisine. It's called multi cuisine restaurants. So starting from local food uh-huh. and uh, Indian, obviously. Uh-huh. Indian means northern Indian foods. It's called Punjabi food, actually. Uh-huh. And we do serve Chinese, but... V- it's a, technically, it's called Chinese, but Indianized Chinese. The tastes have been uh, developed uh-huh. according to Indian taste. I'm so curious what so, it looks like. Yeah, normally we serve those noodles, fried rice, uh, the chicken things you have here, yeah. chicken mix, etc. But the taste will be different. Uh-huh. And uh, we serve uh, continental food also, like pizza, pasta, oh. burger, etc. You know? So you, you also bake... Pizza and other stuff. Oh, uh, we do. Oh, wow. So your customers are mainly locals? Uh, I would say 50% locals, but uh-huh. dur- during tourist time, mm-hmm. uh, see, tourist season. So mostly they will be tourists. And then you can bring your tour to your restaurant? Uh, I do that sometime. Uh-huh. But every time I cannot tell them to go to my restaurant. So because last time you mentioned... Like food-wise, because different religions, they will have different things that they don't eat. So only a restaurant, you must have been, you you have to pay attention to these. Yes, that is quite challenging. Especially uh, in my place, uh, the restriction of food. Uh, Not only in my place, I think all over India. Yeah. Because uh, since we have uh, people following different culture, different uh, religion. Mm -hmm. So every religion have a different set of rules. Mm. Like, uh, for example, like Hindus, they are not supposed to eat beef. Mm -hmm. Like Muslims, they are not supposed to eat pork. Pork. Mm -hmm. So for Buddhists, we are not supposed to eat none of the non-vegetarian, but Mm -hmm. still people does eat. Yeah. And there are like days in our place. In a month, there will be two, three holy days, like full moon, new moon. Uh So those days uh, all over Ladakh. And the restaurants are not supposed to serve any non-vegetarian food. Oh. Only vegetarian. I see. That's a, a local, I think, local kind of tradition which we have to follow. Uh-huh. So in terms of that, those are challenging when it comes to serving tourists, make them understand why we are not serving uh, yeah. on that particular day. Yeah. So, but still, that is how it is. Uh-huh. 
And then you also mentioned something about fishing. Fishing actually in Ladakh, we being not being a coastal area, we don't have that much of fishes, uh, a variety of yeah. fish, you know. Mm-hmm. But still, we have uh, fish in the river because, uh, like I think I haven't mentioned about, uh, we have Indus River, mm-hmm. which is one of the largest, longest river in yeah. the whole India, all Asia, you know. Mm-hmm. So we get good fishes actually, but. Uh, from our childhood, I don't know, like maybe it's because of the Buddhist culture, Buddhist influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have been told that uh, we normally should not do fishing. Uh-huh. There are different rules, there are different reasons behind that, you know. Uh-huh. But what I've been told by my parents is that uh, in Buddhist tradition, mm-hmm. they say like uh, when we have a kettle, mm-hmm. like we have a cow, we have a sheep, goat, you know. Mm-hmm. At least we have chicken. At mm-hmm. least we raise them, we feed them. Yeah. And we have some rights over them, you know. Uh-huh. But for So you're taking care of Yeah, taking care of them and then we are taking something in return. Actually, that is also prohibited according to the Buddhist tradition, but still at least it is ethical, you know, to take mm-hmm. their lives. But when it comes to fish which lives in wild, you know, yeah. kind of nature. atmosphere, mm-hmm. nature. And when it comes to other wild animals also, like we have Tibetan blue sheep, we have antelope, we have deer. Mm -hmm. Those are like people go for hunting also. But Mm -hmm. according to our belief, they say like we don't have any contribution in their life. Mm -hmm. We don't raise them. So we have no, ethically we have no rights to kill them. Mm -hmm. So that is one reason actually. I don't know how justifiable it is, but still people say it. So that is how in our place. Especially people believing in Buddhist religion, Mm -hmm. we don't do that much of fishing Mm -hmm. and we don't do that much of hunting also. Mm -hmm. Now that uh, things are changing, so because of the Wildlife Act also, Mm -hmm. we have been prohibited to go for poaching, hunting, Uh uh, especially the wild animals. We Even though we don't have that much of abundance of wild animals, Mm -hmm. whatever is left, we that's a strict rule in that. Mm-hmm. But fish for the fishing, there's no particular law, mm-hmm. but it is just a local belief. But there are other religion people, they go for fishing also. I see. So then I can imagine in your restaurant, you serve chicken mm-hmm. and then lamb. Uh, chicken and lamb. Uh-huh. And we do serve fish also. But those fishes <laughs> does not come from the river. Uh-huh. We don't do fishing. Uh-huh. But those come from farm. Ah, fish, farms. fish farms. Fish farms. I see. And mostly fish farms are located uh, not in Ladakh, mm-hmm. but in Srinagar uh-huh. and other part of India. I see. So then you can buy from them. Yes. We have a supplier, so they get it for us. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you are constantly seeking or you're interested in doing different things. Mm-hmm. So is there anything new coming up? Uh, besides uh, the restaurant and... Uh, travel business. Recently, I have, uh, along with my brother, Mm -hmm. we have started uh, a construction-related shop, Mm -hmm. which is like a storehouse and where we normally supply uh, those construction material to the hotels, houses, etc. Mm -hmm. Uh, Since my brother is an architect, Uh so we have some sort of uh, venturing into construction business also. Mm -hmm. So it's been like four, three, four years we have started that store. So that is related with mostly, it's called hardware, you know. Do you have a storefront that you do business with like other companies? Uh, Not exactly companies, but uh, uh, the system actually out here and my place is very different. Uh-huh. Normally when you construct a house out here, uh-huh. uh, I think yours is a very systematic way. When you, want to, when you want to construct a house, you hire some expert people to construct your house, right? Uh-huh. You don't have to do anything. But in my place, since it's like a different setup, yeah. so when we, when for us, suppose I want to construct a house, I do shopping for the house from the scratch. Uh-huh. From the from steel, from cement, from sand, whatever construction material. Yeah. Everything, being an owner, I will go to the market and I will do the shopping. Uh-huh. So after that, only after that, we will hire a worker. Yeah. And then those workers will be constructing a house for you. Using the material Using that you the provided. Using the material we buy. Owner uh-huh. will buy. So that is the case. That's why in our place, like when we set up a shop, uh, those people who want to construct a house, uh-huh. in that matter, even hotels also, uh-huh. they'll come to your shop. They will buy whatever they want. They will negotiate I with see. you. Not uh-huh. the company will contact you. Yeah. So then all the houses, no matter residential or like office building or restaurants, mm-hmm. then... 
the owner will do the shopping? Ah, uh, in most of the cases, I would not say like hundred percent cases, but uh, mostly ninety percent cases. Some big hotels. Uh, if if somebody is like uh, wants to construct a very big hotel, yeah. So of course they will uh, consult some construction company, some uh-huh. interior designer, etc. Yeah, yeah. That is also a latest trend in the society. But uh-huh. before that, everything would be done by the owner. I see. Which is like the most natural or organic way yes, to do it. Yes, and that is, it's going to be a family matter actually. Sometimes, uh-huh. the like in a family, everyone will be assigned a job. The father will look after this, mother will look after this. Mm-hmm. The kids will have to go for other shopping. Yeah, that kind of things, you know. But actually, that is what I was discussing with Cindy also last time. Mm-hmm. That like, uh, if you make that kind of ha- house in that manner. Mm-hmm. It gives you a more like sense of belonging feeling, you know. Yeah, because you kind of build it from zero. From zero, yes. Yeah, some of my American friends mm-hmm. they are building their own home, like mm-hmm. making different room dividers or like putting up tiles.、Mm-hmm. And I do think that if you source your own material and if you make the floor yourself or build the wall yourself. Then you have more attachment to these things. Ah,、uh, yes, I think so.、Mm-hmm. And you have that kind of satisfaction. Oh, this was designed by me. It was built by me. You know.、Mm-hmm. But if you get a ready-made kind of house, some ready-made kind of apartment, you just have to move in. You know. Yeah. This,、uh, in that case, I think that sense of you know belonging is missing. And from what you just told me, it's like you have so many jobs. Mm-hmm. And you also said that when you are、uh, back home, when you are working, you're kind of a workaholic. So, what is a typical day like for you? Because you kind of have to split your time between three businesses,、mm-hmm. and yeah, how do you handle your time? Actually, What's the day like? <laughs> my day starts、uh, when it is a、uh, working season.、Mm-hmm. My day starts pretty early. Yeah, maybe six, seven in the morning. Uh-huh. Because when you are in travel business,、uh, you have to be attentive to your customer from、yeah. the beginning. So that is how I started getting call from the morning, and after that,、uh, the restaurant obviously it doesn't open that early. Yeah, because、uh, we don't serve breakfast; we just serve lunch and dinner. brunch,、uh, dinner, etc. I see. So normally, my restaurant opening time is after eleven. So before that, I'm free.、Mm-hmm. So and、uh, for the construction. That shop, particular store, I have like few workers、um, who have been assigned the responsibility.、Uh-huh. I just have to lo- go and look after the accounts later on、yeah. in a day. Yeah. So that is how I do. And besides my business,、uh, I am doing some sort of social services also、uh-huh. recently. Uh huh. So I am working with some NGO. Uh huh. And、uh, I've been assigned a job of、uh, looking after the education branch of that particular NGO. NGO. I see. So that is also keeping me busy lately, but it's been almost one and a half year now. Because、uh-huh. since during COVID time, there was nothing much to do. Yeah. So I just thought, okay, I can contribute something. Yeah. From my time to that particular NGO.、Uh-huh. So right now,、uh, we we have two schools、uh-huh. for the poor people,、yeah. like poor kids, or、yeah. orphan, semi-orphan. Yeah. So we have around two hundred, two hundred fifty. Students、uh-huh. coming from different part of the region.、Uh-huh. So our job is to look after the school management,、uh, finding a sponsor for the kids,、uh-huh. and all those things we have to do. You know. So that also I do it, but、uh, of course I don't go to the school every day.、Uh-huh. But、uh, once in a week,、uh-huh. we have to have a meeting. We have to go to the school and see how's everything going on. You know,、uh-huh. things like that. For your traveling business and restaurant, you have to handle your customers by yourself. Actually, I have a staff to take care of the things on the ground. Yeah, but sometimes you cannot、uh, like. Since I told you, ah,、uh, mine is、uh, like not a very big business. Yeah, where I have like fifty hundreds of employees, you know, working、mm-hmm. for me. So I just have two three employees looking after. Yeah. So, but still giving a personal attention. Mm-hmm. Is very important.、Mm-hmm. That is what I feel. So I have to do it. But fortunately, in the restaurant business, because I've started that in 2017,、uh-huh. so it's been like four five years now. Yeah. So I feel now that my boys are trained enough. Yeah. So recently, it's been like one year now. 
I don't have to look after the restaurant that much. Oh, no, it's, congratulations. It's, it's some kind of in a autopilot mode, you know. Uh-huh. So I just have to go maybe once in a day just to have a look after the things, what is going on. Uh-huh. And uh, that is how it works. And So I'm kind of relaxed now. Even yeah. though right now I'm here, but uh, I just, uh, you know, remotely I try to control uh-huh. through a... Just you know, check on certain points. Check on the certain... Uh, Sometimes you have to look after the camera, what is going on, and then just talk to the boy, my boys, you know. Mm-hmm. So do you still go to the market and do the shopping? Initially, I used to do that because uh, my, I, as I told you, most of my staffs they were not from Ladakh because in Le, since our population is very less, so yeah. getting a manpower is not uh, very easy, mm-hmm. skilled one in most of the cases. So most of my staff are non-locals. So initially, when we started the restaurant, uh, they did not know about the places, the where to shop, where to do, uh, yeah. where to get a good deal. Yeah. So I used to do that. It was fun. At the same time, it was challenging. Uh huh. And I mean, you have to let them fam- get familiar with the place. Ah uh, yes. Are they happy working in Ladakh though? Of course, it's difficult for them. Mm-hmm. But uh, what I feel is like I try to make them feel like family. Some of them, they have been working with me since 2017, the day when I started. Yeah. 50% of my staff are still with me. So uh-huh. they are like a family oh, and yeah. we are like brothers. That's nice. So for me or my friends or anyone who want to visit Ladakh, we can ask you to plan our trips. Yes, of course. <laughs> that, I would happily do that. I'm Really excited. I mean, it will be so different and so nice to visit your hometown. It will be. At the same time, it will be challenging, but you will have a different experience. That is for sure. Yeah. And speaking of that, because your family, your parents are coming to Taipei soon. Mm -hmm. This is their first time coming to Taiwan. Yes. Actually, in fact, this is their first time traveling abroad. Mm Mm-hmm. Because in my society, yeah, especially the uh, older generation, mm-hmm. they don't have a habit of going yeah traveling outside is... of the country. Mm-hmm. You know, what do you think they will feel? Because yeah, you mentioned about the differences and then the culture shock. What do you want to show them, or what do you think they will feel about this place? First of all, they will be surprised. Mm-hmm. Because they they are traveling abroad for the first time. Yeah. And uh, secondly, they are traveling to a place like city like Taipei, mm-hmm. which is uh, like one of the most developed in Asia, I would say. Mm-hmm. So it will be it will be a different experience for them. Mm-hmm. Because I think for my parents, they have never seen a skyscraper. They have never been to such a high building. They have never been to such a Crowded, I would say crowded places because they have been to places like Delhi and other places, but yeah. not very clean and organized city like Taipei. Uh-huh. So the, that will be, I think, good point. Uh-huh. And the only one challenge I think they will face is the food. Mm-hmm. Because uh, they are not used to having non-Indian foods, you know. Uh-huh. So I see. For the first time, they're like going outside of India. Yeah. So that would be that will be a different challenge. But I think it is for a short time, and moreover, they will be staying in a Airbnb. Logic was to let them cook for themselves. You know. Yeah. At so least you have sometime. a kitchen. Yeah. They, we have a kitchen, and then they can bring uh, their some own stuff, and mm-hmm. then you can just try. And then the day they arrive in Taipei, they will have the very first. Like a non-Indian food mm-hmm. meal with everybody. That will be interesting. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Especially for my mom. Because yeah. she's a pure vegetarian. Yeah. So for her, seeing lots of non-vegetarian items at the same time and being, I told you, being a very devoted Buddhist, yeah, uh, they have a different outlook, actually. Well, would it be... Because uh, my mom, whenever she see a TV also, she see uh, people like... Uh, having chicken or uh, fishes, lots of fish, fishing and everything. She feels so sad for them, you know, those yeah. the creature. And then when we sh- when she will come here, if she goes to local market, she will see lots of fishes, lots of um, chicken hanging around, you know. It would be a different experience. It's not that in Ladakh we don't have it, but uh, the kind of quantity you have it here and kind of quantity we have it here is different. You know? 
Would it be disrespectful? Or no, no, no. I don't think so. She's flexible enough. She's you know mature enough to understand. <laughs> uh, But it will be a different experience. Yeah, especially for her, I think. Yeah, I I think it's nice that you and your brother will be on her side, and then she can share her thoughts, or you can take some load or some stress. From her, and moreover, uh, we are like you know giving her some practice in a sense that you know I've already like whenever we discuss about uh, going to Taipei, going to Taiwan, yeah, me and my brother, my sister-in-law, you know, we just keep on telling her things will be like this, things will be like that, you know, yeah. So it's kind of like theoretically she knows everything about it, not everything, but at least uh, she have some idea. Uh huh. And when it comes to uh. The place, you know, Taipei. Yeah. She like whenever Cindy calls me, whenever I call her. Sometimes we are outdoor, we call them, and then um, my mom, she sees the place and she's oh, such a nice and clean place, and she said like, uh, how would Cindy feel when she's in Ladakh because it's a very dusty place. Uh、mm-hmm. huh. So she knows about she knows quite a lot about Taipei,、mm-hmm. but I want her to see from her own eyes. Yeah, and that will feel a, it. That will be a fun, actually. When you first、um, told your family that you fell in love with someone that's not from Ladakh,、mm-hmm. was it a difficult thing to say? Ah,、uh, well, it wasn't difficult for me to say, but、uh, maybe for them it was difficult to accept it. Uh huh. But it is not that first time I met Cindy, and I just told them, "Okay, I'm going to get married to this girl." Uh huh. Maybe initially they thought, "Okay, okay, just like um two." Short kind of love story, and then later on things will, you know,、mm-hmm. things might not work out.、Mm-hmm. So, but、uh, it was not challenging for me. Fortunately, I think my parents, even though they come from a small place,、mm-hmm. but still, I feel I'm fortunate enough. They are very open-minded, you know,、mm-hmm. very supportive. I see. So then, actually, from the very early stage that you started dating,、mm-hmm. you introduced or you told them that. You met this girl from Taipei,、mm-hmm. and you're dating. Yes,、uh, not from the first day.、Mm-hmm. Uh, we started dating, and after some time, I have some kind of confidence that you know it's going to work out. Yeah. Then I started telling my mom. Especially moms are easy target. Actually,、uh-huh. they're more emotional, so it's easy to tell them <laughs> compared to dad. You know. Yeah. <laughs> But in my case, my father is also very cool. You know,、uh-huh. he's like.、Uh, Very sober kind, very supportive kind.、Mm-hmm. But、uh, I'm very close to my mom,、mm-hmm. so I told her, and then I show, I've shown Cindy's picture to her. You know,、mm-hmm. even so, when I say like uh, uh, she's from Taiwan, and first time when she saw the picture of Cindy, she liked her because we have a particular like I would not say same kind of face, but.、Uh, Racially, ethnically, we are like same, you know, Asian face. Yeah. So yeah. it was easy for her to accept it.、Mm-hmm. Had it been some、uh, Caucasian or some European lady, things would be different case, you know.、Mm. Yeah. So I think there was a connection. Uh huh. It was well connected, and then the day when I took Cindy to Ladakh to、mm-hmm. introduce to my mom,、mm-hmm. that is the most touching story. One of the most touching moment in our like story, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom, she met Cindy for the first time. They had a conversation, like not ever a conversation. They just hug each other, and my mom literally cried, you know,、mm-hmm. because I、uh, yeah, I'll tell you one story that's like kind of emotional. Actually, I had a sister. Me, me and my brother had a sister also.、Mm-hmm. In two thousand eight, we lost her in an accident, you know. Uh huh. So my mom was in very much shock、uh-huh. from two thousand eighty two thousand eight till I、yeah. think till the day she met Cindy. Uh-huh. And after, like, when she met Cindy, maybe I have a feeling that you know, my mom must have thought that okay, she has found her daughter back. You know,、yeah. I have that kind of feeling because the way she reacted, the way she cried, you know,、mm-hmm. seeing Cindy for the first time. Yeah, I feel something like that. Wow. So after that, they are very close, actually. Even、uh-huh. though they don't speak、uh, language, Mandarin, like Cindy, doesn't speak.、Um, Ladakhi language well.、Mm-hmm. They have a language barrier,、mm-hmm. but still I could see they have a connection.、Mm-hmm. And my mom's my mom is very fond of Cindy,、mm-hmm. and I feel Cindy has the same feeling for my mom. So it's yeah, it's good, I think、actually. language is something that you can communicate, but communication is not all about using the words. So 
when you live together, when you see each other in your face, then um, yeah, there is certain special connection that's being made. That's true. It's not very important. And in that, uh, in my case, I would give a credit to Cindy also because she's very friendly and lively. You know, mm -hmm. that is what I love her. Love her about the most. You know, she's very friendly. She she makes you feel very comfortable. Yeah. And uh, that is why I think my mom, my family loves her also because we could feel our presence. You know, mm -hmm. in the house when she's around. And that's really important for being family together. Yes. Even though it's challenging for her sometime, mm -hmm. but still, you know, she tried to be brave enough to face it, you know. Mm -hmm. So that is what I appreciate about her, actually. And this time you are actually in Taiwan for Chinese New Year. You must have met like a lot of people for the family. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about the family? And is there something you want to tell them or... Mm, yes, I met so many new faces. Mm -hmm. A kind of surprise for me also. It's a good thing. Every time like I come here, I I get to meet new people. Yeah. That is nice. And I would say people in Taiwan are very friendly. Ever since I've started coming to Taiwan, they've never made me feel like I'm a stranger. Even though they cannot speak to me, even though I cannot speak to them, but at least in their eyes, I can see that I've been welcomed, you know. All of you made me feel like home, Baba Mama also, mm -hmm. even though we don't speak much. Sometimes I just wish that I can speak much more mm -hmm. Mandarin so that I can have a more conversation with everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. But that is how it is, you know. I try my best, but since I'm not very good at language, so, you know, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. But still, now I'm getting used to it and, and I feel like home. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. But again, it is good to see new people every every time I come, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe Cindy is keeping me surprised, you know. <laughs> Every time I come here, I get to meet new relatives, new friends, you know. Mm -hmm. That is fun. But I think for her, it will be boring because when she visited for the first time, she met everybody. She met everybody or she met the friends who are still there with me. There's no new friend, new, new, no new surprises for her, you know. Except my little niece. Uh -huh. She was recently born, so she's, a, she's something new for Cindy. Oh, when your parents are here, how shall we call them? I heard Cindy called them Abale, Abale. And Amale. Amale. Abale is for father and Amale is for mother. mother. What do your friends call your parents? Friends will call them uncle and auntie. Ah, oh, uncle and auntie. In local language, it's called Ajangle and Anele. Actually, Le is like uh, in my language, Le is like somewhat uh, when you call Baba, Mama. Mm -hmm. But you want to show more respect, then you say Baba Le, Mama Le. Le is like you, it's like a suffix. Oh, you know? I see. When I call Cindy, I call Cindy out of love, Cindy Le. Means oh. you want to show more respect and so more love. Le -le? No? Yes. Oh. Otherwise, um, if you don't want to show much respect and love, you can just say like, Abba Ama. Mm -hmm. Abba Ama. Baba mm -hmm. Mama. It's almost similar, I think. So when you add the Le, le. it's more respectful. More respectful. Would it be more distant? No, no, no. Oh, so... More close, actually. Oh, I see. So, which would be better? Like, should we call them Uncle Le or... I think whichever is convenient for you, they will feel good. What did Cindy's aunt call them when she visited I you? think she never get a chance to call them by their name or... Right. To address yeah, them. because like when you're like talking face to face, you don't really have to address. Yes, they've been just uh, passing smile to each other. Yeah, like I did eventually when I come here. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I was not very comfortable with Baba Mama also. Yeah, so I wasn't. I was in some kind of confusion whether I should call them Uncle Auntie, mm -hmm. Baba Mama, or you know. So, so what do you call them now? Now I call them Baba Mama because I'm more yeah. close to them. Yeah, but initially. Uh -huh. It was, you know, kind mm. of very confusing for me. And I can understand their problem also. Especially for Baba Mama, mm -hmm. it would be difficult because since I'm from India, which, are very, which is a very far off place, mm -hmm. and frankly speaking, there are many rumors about India. There are many bad things about India also, which I accept. So it would be difficult for them mm -hmm. to accept it, you know. So it takes time it takes for time. each other to understand more. Yes. 
And and then once they know you better and better,、mm -hmm. then they know you are the person that Cindy chose. Yeah. And there is a reason why you get get together well. Maybe there is one reason that we it took us so much time, you know, time to get married also.、Mm -hmm. Because we have to convince so many people with different background. Yes. So it was challenging. And there's COVID. Yeah, there's a COVID, and finally we made it. So it's nice.、Mm -hmm. You feel more satisfied, more relaxed now. I'm so happy for you and Cindy. I do have one last question: Is、okay. that is there a certain word that in your native language、mm -hmm. that we should learn or we could learn? Perhaps we can say to your family, or it is something that it's nice or special for us to pick up. Uh, I think it's very easy word. You know, you can simply say Julie. 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 That is a way to greet, way to say thank you.、Mm -hmm. It's like、uh, Julie is a multi-purpose word actually. Especially when you're traveling to Ladakh, also when you meet somebody on the street, say Julie.、Mm -hmm. When somebody offers you something, you say Julie.、Mm -hmm. uh, when you want to show gratitude to somebody, say Julie. And Julie is like something ice-breaking word. You know? Oh, especially nice. Especially when you're traveling. It opens up many things, you know. So to end our recording session, I can actually say, "Gelekle, Julie." Julie. Yes. Ah.、Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can also say Julie. I can say "Shishi," yeah, "Shishi." Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. You're welcome.